Um, this etymology we mentioned earlier, a slave is someone who is 100% taxable. Right? So we have to distinguish between should and, and facts. So there are some ideas, words, and terms which I think we ought to try to avoid or at least be very careful of when we use them. We go through a few of those. One is conflating government with society and state, or conflating society with state, or conflating government with state, or conflating con country with state. The problem is, if you say you're against the government, people think you're against law and order, because they think you're against the governing institutions of society, when really we're against the state. Okay? So what libertarians are against is the state. The state currently monopolizes and runs the government, the, the governing organizations of society, law, justice, uh, order, the state also runs the roads, but we don't say we're against roads, do we? We say we're against government roads, or state roads, we should say. Just like we say we're against state education. Okay? So we have to be careful when we say we're against government because you'll have anarchists or regular people think that you're for chaos and lawlessness, sort of anarchist, uh, the idea of the anarchist was a bomb. Okay? We have to say we're against the state, if you want to be clear and precise. Another one is, People say, well, I'm against coercion, I'm a libertarian, or I'm against violence. Well, no, we're not against violence. We're not even against coercion. We're against aggression. Aggression is the initiated use of force, or the initiated violence, or initiated coercion. Coercion is just a type of force, right? It means to use force to compel someone to do something. If someone's breaking in my house, you're, you're, you know, I'm going to coerce the guy, and it's rightful. So we're not against coercion, we're not against force, we're not against violence. We're against initiated force, coercion, and violence, or aggression. Another one which I'll deal with in a few minutes is labor versus action. People always talk about owning the fruits of your labor. Uh, people have a right to sell their labor, these kind of things. They act like labor is some special thing. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, labor is just a type of action. Humans own their bodies. We act in certain ways. That's human action. Labor is just a type of action, maybe a subset of action. What kind of action is it? It's action that you has disutility, some people say. It's not leisure, it's not fun. You do it to get some in. But it's just one type of action. Okay. And then there's, of course, intellectual property, which begs the question just by saying that. Right? Some of us don't think it should be property. So don't call it property to prove that it should be treated as property. It's better to call it an intellectual privilege or just call it patent and copyright, what, what the government calls. Finally, another one, which uh, Jeff Tucker and I were talking about on the way up here this morning, is the idea of limited government. This one always bugs me, because you know every government that's ever existed is limited. There's never been an unlimited government. I mean, maybe the Nazis, maybe the Russians at a certain point in time. But every government has limits, or every state, I should say, right? There's limits on what it can do. Um, and almost everyone believes in some limits. So welfare liberals believe in a limited government. They just want the limits to be a lot less than we would like. So what defines a conservative, I mean, an ultra-minimalist conservative, or a classical liberal, or a libertarian, it's not that we believe in limited government, it's what limits we believe there should be on the state, right? And the most consistent, most radical libertarians think that the limits should be complete. It means the state should have nothing you could do whatsoever. In other words, the state should die and not exist. But even a minarchist believes that the limits should be completely um, uh, so tight that the state can only do a few minimal functions, defense, police, and courts. Okay. So when you say limited government, that doesn't really distinguish us from, from others. Okay. So in thinking about how to define the essence of libertarianism over the years, I think the best way to think of it is that we, we recognize that we are all people who live in society with each other. We all, at least the civilized people among us, we generally want our own lives to be good, but we also favor peace and prosperity, and we want our neighbors to be good, and we like living in society with each other. And we all realize the following. We realize, now this is Mises, I'm going to go into a very little bit. Mises was, uh, in my mind, the, the greatest uh, Austrian economist, and he developed a theory called praxeology. That's the, the logic or the science of human action. So what Mises says is, just, and this is not, it sounds funny, it's a weird word. It took me a long time to understand it, like epistemology took 17 years before I finally started using the word, right? I'm still not there with ontology, but with epistemology. Praxeology, I am. Mises says, look, it's common sense. Look at human action. What do human beings do in their lives? Every moment of their lives, they're taking an action. Now, an action means you're, a, you're an intelligent, rational person. You understand something about the world. You know that the future is coming. And you envision something about the future you think is going to happen that you're not satisfied with. 
that you want to change. This is what human action is. We don't think of it like this, but this is what we do in every moment of our lives. And we also realize that we have the ability to affect that future. How? By using what Mises calls scarce means. These are things in the world that you can use to change the course of the future, including your body and including things that we find, tools, basically. And we have some understanding or some knowledge in our, in our mind that we've accumulated from human civilization and from society in the past, from others, from learning, from emulation. We have some knowledge about what we think is coming, what we think might satisfy us better than what would come if we don't take an action, and what means are available and how they will causally change things. So that's what human action is. It's understanding, making a choice, uh, grabbing some kind of means, and employing that means to change the future. This is how we have to understand human action. And within that framework, we can understand libertarianism is the idea that we understand that these means are scarce. Scarce means rivals. It means only one person can use this thing at a time. Uh, otherwise, you'll have two or more people fighting over this thing, clashing over it, having conflict, violent disagreement. So an example would be, you know, baking a cake. Everyone, you need a recipe, which is the knowledge of how to make the cake, and you need the tools, the capital equipment, the ingredients, the raw materials. Only one person can use this egg at a time to make the cake, or this wooden spoon, or this bowl, or this oven, right? But any number of people could use their own eggs and their own ingredients, all using the same recipe or the same knowledge at the same time. This is exactly why the intellectual property idea is so fallacious. Intellectual property seeks to grant property rights in the ideas as well as we do in the scarce means. It makes no sense because you don't need to put property rights in the ideas because they're not scarce. There's no, the entire purpose of property rights is to permit conflicts to be avoided in the use of the scarce means of action. So we can all go about our daily business and our plans, cooperating with each other, trading with each other, uh, helping each other, selling to each other, using our own scarce resources with the legally recognized exclusive right to control it. That's what property rights are, that's what ownership is. It makes no sense to grant these rights in, in ideas. Now, I'm not going to go into that detail, that's the entire intellectual property argument I've been making for a few years now. But I just want to put it in the framework. This is what the libertarian idea is. Now, what does this have to do with law? Okay. So the way that we formulate this is to think that the essence of libertarianism is a very simple set of rules. As I mentioned earlier, we can't say we're for limited government. because That doesn't distinguish us from other schools of thought. And you can't say we're for property rights, because that doesn't distinguish us either. Why not? Because property rights are inherent in every human society, in every political system that's ever existed. Communists believe in property rights. Socialists believe in property rights. Fascists believe in property rights. Environmentalists believe in property rights. Welfare liberals believe in property rights. We believe in property rights. What's the difference? How they're assigned, that's the difference. So we look at the world and we see scarce resources that need to be controlled by someone, by the legal system, so that they can be used peacefully, productively. And our rule is simple, it's the Lockean rule. The Lockean rule basically says, Whoever can show the better claim to a resource gets it. And the better claim is defined as either the first person who transformed it, that's with his labor, in a sense, or if you acquired it by contract from someone else. It's very simple. Contract plus first appropriation. Now, what, what's the reason for the first appropriation rule? Now, Locke spelled this out in his argument. If no one had the right to be the first one to use prop, a, a resource, it could never be used. Someone has got to be the first one to use this unknown thing out there. If he's got the right to, to use it, and he's got a right to keep it, because otherwise the second guy can take it from him, which is, which is not a property right system. That's a system of violent clashing. So it's almost like the Misesian monetary regression theorem, right? When you trace back the origin of the value of, of gold-type money to its, to, its, to its pure commodity, non-monetary use. It's like that. You can see who's got a, a resource now, trace the title back to the first act of appropriation. This is what we say. Now, you can add one more rule. You can say that there's, if someone commits an act of aggression, some kind of tort, you harm someone else, you violate their rights. Because you perform that action, you have committed, you, you, you uh, incurred an obligation to compensate them. Right? So they might get a claim to your property because of that. So we could, we could modify the rules. The person who owns a resource is either the person who acquired it by contract from an owner, 
or who first appropriated it, or who acquired it because of some act of crime by the original owner. Okay? Other than that, there's no other ways to own property. Now, what did Locke say? Locke, what Locke said, he basically said this, but he had some extra stuff in his argument. Locke said, God created the universe. God owns the universe. God created Adam and Eve. He owned them. But God, in his benevolence, he's apparently a libertarian, granted <laughs> dominion of all the unowned resources that he created to men. So within the human sphere, whether there's a God or not, whether you care that God's our slave owner or how you look at that, the point is that there's a system set up where the rule is that each man is a self-owner. That's what Locke called it. Now remember, the danger of saying self-owner, better to say he's a body owner. But that's the resource in dispute, right? I care if someone stabs my body, not if they stab myself. Okay. Um, so every person is a self-owner. And then here's what Locke said. Here's the problem, I think, uh, with Locke's argument. Locke said, if you own yourself, then you own the labor you perform with your body or yourself. First off, I think he right now is a critical libertarian legal theory, uh, you know, legal theorist who wonders what words mean. I'm kind of nagging, a nagging feeling is, what does that really mean to own your labor? But I'll go with that. And then Locke says, so you own this labor. Now I'm thinking like a substance, you know, emanating from myself. And so if it mixes with something unowned, well, I own the labor, so the only way I can keep ownership of that labor is to own the thing it's mixed with. Otherwise, you're taking my labor away from me. Right? So this is his argument for why we can appropriate unowned resources. Now, David Hume, writing later, the law was in the 1600s, and Hume was a little bit later, um, pointed out, and I agree with Hume, Hume pointed out that this argument of blocks is overly figurative or metaphorical. We don't really own our labor. We own our bodies. If you own your body, that means you have the right to perform whatever actions you want with it. And you can use those to sell uh, for your services to someone. But think about it. If, I, if I, someone pays me to sing a song, they give me a dollar after I sing a song for them. The song pleases them. But do they own the song now? Do they, are they in possession of a song? No, they're in possession of a memory. Can I say that I gave them a memory? I suppose, but I didn't really own a memory that I transferred to them. This is all completely imprecise metaphorical stuff. And you don't need it. It's unnecessary. As you pointed out, Locke's argument works if you simplify it and you take out this stuff. Locke's argument works because, for the reasons I mentioned earlier, the libertarian reason. When you have an object that is disputed or contested, a scarce resource, then there really can be no other answer than that the person has a better claim to it that was the first one to appropriate. Because if you don't give him that right, then, as I said, no one can ever appropriate anything in the first place. Or they will appropriate it with violence and people squabbling over it, which, again, defeats the purpose of having a legal system that permits resources to be used in a conflict-free way. Okay? So this is the problem. Now, you might say, well, he could have worded it better. But what's the problem with this? The problem is this entire mentality, this entire approach, has led to a deep, vast confusion that has contaminated and infected political theory ever since his day. Arguably, it also, at least partially, contributed to the rise of a related doctrine called the labor theory of value, which is more of an economic idea, which is what contaminated Ricardo's and Adam Smith's and then Marx's thought. Right? The labor theory of value has this mystical idea that you know the value of a product is based upon the labor that went into it. Now, there's several mistakes here. Number one, value is subjective. Right? There's no value in things. So all right away, he's thinking in intrinsic value terms. It makes no sense whatsoever, as Manger and the Austrians have shown. Right? Um, and furthermore, you don't own labor. Labor is not a substance. And of course, the idea that you have two laborers who mix their labor with two objects, one's high quality, one's low quality. If this guy put 100 hours into it, this guy did it in 10, they're not going to have the same value. So then you have to reverse engineer your theory and say, well, now we have to have a multiplier coefficient on this guy's labor. So then you just kind of have a contorted theory. Anyway, that's the labor theory value, which resulted in communism and hundreds of millions of deaths. So, you know, if Locke's to blame for that, I guess we can say he's a little bit negligent. But I won't blame Locke for that, because, you know, you can trace these ideas back to, uh, to uh, Muslim thinkers back in the 1200s, I mean, a long time ago. Uh, but there's some evidence that, that this idea of labor as this thing people can own, this metaphorical approach, did lead to the Marxian labor theory of value. But the problem with Locke is the labor theory of property. Again, the idea that you own things that you mix your labor with. This is obviously not true. For example, if I'm an employee of a company, 
which Marx would abolish, I guess, right? And I'm paid to mix my labor to build a chair out of the employer's wood and nails. Well, I mix my labor with it. Why don't I own it? Well, because there's a contract, and I never owned it in the first place. Okay? So the problem with the labor theory of property is it has led to this idea, libertarians will say this all the time, sort of casual thinking, not very precise. They'll say there are three sources of property ownership. Number one, if you find something, original appropriation or homestead, right, it blocks that deal. The libertarian issue. Number two, by contract, by contractual acquisition. They're right about that. If you want to mention a third, it should be you know, some kind of aggression, which I mentioned can, can trigger a property type of transfer, but that's a way of transferring the title that exists already. So let's say finding something or by contract with the previous owner. And then they'll say the third way you can own something is by creation. See, what they're doing is they're going back to this labor idea. They're thinking, they're mixing things together. They're thinking humans are productive. We labor. Our labor, our intellect, our intellectual creativity helps create things of value. And just as I labor in a field and make a valuable form out of it, I must own that because I labored on it, which means I own anything that I create with my labor. You see how they go from one argument to the next? They never stop and ask the question, well, what's an ownable thing in the first place? You know, and then sometimes they'll argue by possessives, the most maddening thing. Like, well, if, if I don't own my, my labor, who does? Well, I like the word, the, the word my means I have to own it. I mean, I have a wife, my wife, my girlfriend, you know, my job, my customers. Do I own those because there's a possessive? No, sloppy thinking. So another dangerous word that I wanted to get to is the word property. We have this tendency to refer to things that we own as property, like, you know, this, uh, this iPad is my property. Now, I think it would be better to say this scarce resource, I have a property right in this scarce resource, or I own this scarce resource. Because when you start saying that's my property, look, think about why the word property was used in the first place. Locke said you have a propriety in your things. What he's talking about is that when a human being acts in the world, right? We don't just use our bodies. We have standing room, we have other scarce resources that we employ to affect change, as I mentioned. All these things are sort of within the orbit of your control. They're a property of yourself in the sense that they're a feature of yourself. They're a characteristic of yourself. They're a way of describing part of your nature or your identity. Okay? So what they're talking about is what's proper to man. What's proper for a man to be able to rightfully control. So that's why the word property and property rights is used now as like a type of metonymy, if you know what that is, to refer to the thing itself. But if we think clearly, we never arrive at the question most intellectual property advocates do, for example, which is, well, the question is, what is property? No, that's not the question. The question is, who owns this resource, always? Because nothing else can be fought over. Because resources are necessarily things that can be fought over or contested. So the question in all of political philosophy is always, always, if you can point to a given resource, something that more than one person desires to use and is potentially comfortable over, who should rightfully be able to control it or own it or have a property right in it? But don't call it property unless you're really careful about it. If you call it property, then you're going to end up with intellectual property, things like this. Okay? So um, the, the problem with the argument is that, it, that there are resources of ownership or property is that it, um, uh, it conflates the source of wealth with the source of property rights. So it is completely true that if I own some raw materials, let's say some paper, or let's say some, some, some wood and some, some metal, and I fashion these things into a chair, I have made an object that is more valuable. More valuable to who? To me, or maybe to a potential customer. Remember, there's no value in the chair. Value is not intrinsic, it's not objective. Value is the sub subjective relationship between valuing and acting human beings. So anyway, I transform resources into a more valuable shape. Or we could say, in economic terms, I have created wealth. Why have I created wealth? because I've made something more valuable to me or someone else. In fact, if two people just trade their objects, two people trade an apple for an orange, they have created wealth by that transaction, right? It's not as possible to kind of say a horizontal trade where the values are equal. In fact, the guy who buys the apple with his orange values the apple more than the orange, and vice versa. That's why they engage in the trade. So each one is better off after the trade. So wealth is created just by pure trade. Wealth is also created by humans laboring on their property. 
Wealth can also be destroyed. If you make a mistake and you ruin your property in an attempt to make a machine or something, then you can lose wealth. But the property rights don't change, right? In fact, for me to make a chair presupposes that I own the raw materials. I already own these raw materials. How did I get them? Well, the first two ways. I either bought them by contract from a previous owner, or I homesteaded them from the state of nature. That's it. So this ownership starts already before the act of creation or the act of production. The act of production is an act of laboring, using your labor, sure, on materials that you already own. Or it could be on someone else's materials. If you're an employee, working on someone else's materials. And then you don't own it. So the key is always who owns the raw material to go into productive labor. So creation, labor, is a source of wealth, but it's not a source of property rights. And if you realize that, you'll never fall into the trap of wondering, well, who, who owns that labor? Who owns that poem? Well, naturally, a poem doesn't spring out of nowhere. If you believe a poem is an ownable thing, or a movie, or a song, or a pattern of information, or a discovery, or a fact, or a database, well, I agree with you know, Tibor McGann. The best candidate for owning that is the guy who created it. But this presupposes that these things are ownable. Not everything is ownable. My memories are not ownable. My love is not ownable. My past is not ownable. The Earth's rotation is not ownable. These are characteristics, ways of describing the universe. You could say, as a practical matter, that I own my actions or I own my memory because I can control them. But that's, if you say it like that, you make the mistake of double counting, right? Because you're saying, well, I own my body and I own my actions. Well, no, you, you have the ability to control what actions you perform because you own your body. It's a consequence, it's derivative. It's not a separate, independent thing. So we can clear our thinking in this way. How are we doing on time, by the way? Oh, I, th I think you're you're fine. I'm going to good. If we clear if we clear up these confusions, then a, a lot of confusions in thinking arise. So as I said, property, limited government, state. Um, let me talk a little bit about one thing I touched on, which is an objection I hear a lot. This is about contracts. Now, I hear this all the time about this labor idea. They say, well. If you don't own your labor, how can you sell it? Right? You hear this all the time. Now, this is because people don't usually have a sophisticated or deep understanding of contract law in general, much less what I think is the libertarian view, which is the Rothbardian Evers view, which he calls the title transfer theory of contract. I don't want to get too much into legal theory. Let me just tell you uh, what I think is a simple way to look at the, the right way to look at contract. First of all, um, in today's legal system, the way contracts are viewed is binding obligations. And that's what most libertarians look at it. If I make a, a promise to you in a certain formality, with a certain formality, in a certain way, then the law, even a private law and an anarchist society, should enforce that promise. Your promises should be binding. Okay? However, even in today's legal system, which, which characterizes the, the contractual realm that way, it doesn't operate that way. So for example, if I promise to sing a song for you at your son's birthday party, um, and I decide not to show up, then you can't go get the cops to drag me there and make me sing. For several reasons. Number one, it, it wouldn't be a very good song, right? <laughs> uh, and that's a practical consideration that courts use. Courts generally don't enforce what's called specific performance, which means they don't actually treat contracts as binding promises. What they do is they make me pay $1,000 damages to the guy in you know, a contract lawsuit. Which means, really, what the contract is is just a transfer of title to property. It's as if I had said, uh, I'm predicting that I will sing at your son's birthday party tomorrow. I'm just making a prediction because I, I know myself pretty well. I don't think I'll change very much. No. I can't bind myself because I might change my mind. But I tell you what, to give myself and my future self an inducement to sing, I will hereby transfer you $1,000 in damage payments conditioned upon my not singing. Okay. That's awful. So that's what the contract is. It's really a transfer of title of property. And that's what Rothbard said. Rothbard said contracts are not, should not be viewed as binding obligations or promises. They should only be viewed as transfers of title to own resources. I just said property. Same thing said. Um, and if you think about it, this is perfectly consistent with and an outcome of the two sources of property rights, the Lockean idea that I mentioned earlier, which is the idea that you own things because of first appropriation or by contract. So contract here means the owner of a resource has the ability to give up his ownership of it 
in favor of someone else, to transfer it to them. That's what contracts are. That's how they need to be viewed. So, how do we reconcile this with the idea that you can sell your labor, like an employment contract or a service contract? The, the problem here is the person making the objection to my argument, the person arguing for IP in effect, the person trying to argue that labor is an ownable thing because you can have a contract with property. What they're doing is they're thinking in terms of the standard symbol contract like the apple versus the orange, right? A typical contract would be two people exchanging titles, apple for orange, okay? It's an exchange, it's a contract. But remember, the definition of contract I mentioned doesn't talk about exchange, it just talks about transfer. So if I give my niece a $1,000 gift to go to college, that's a, tra that's a contract, it's a transfer of title. It's not an exchange, not really. I mean, you could say I get pleasure out of it. Right. But it's definitely not a bilateral exchange. It's a one-way exchange. And this is how we have to think of employment contracts or service contracts. The sale of labor is another dangerous, confusing metaphor. The sale of labor is not really a metaphor. It's not really, it's, it's not really what happens. It's not literally true. What's happening here is people are analogizing this labor contract to a regular exchange. And they're thinking, well, if there's something being sold, there must be an exchange of title. What's being sold? The title to the labor. No. It's like the example I gave earlier about the scene. What's being done is the buyer of my services, you could say, knows that I own my body. He knows I have the power to decide not to sing or to sing, or to pay an expense or not to pay an expense. He knows he's got to motivate me to do what he wants me to do. Just because this guy wants something and is willing to pay for it doesn't mean that thing is an honorable good. He might want it to rain tomorrow. He might want there to be national you know, peace in the world tomorrow. These are not these are the ends of action, but they're not ownable things. Scarce means are what we use to accomplish ends. They are ownable things. The ends of action are often intangible. Um, I might pursue a girl and buy her roses because I want her to go out with me. I want her to marry me and be my wife. But that end is getting a wife. It's got nothing to do with an ownable thing. We have to give up the idea that just because you pursue something and you pay money for it means that the thing you pay for is an ownable thing. It's the same thing with a service contract. I want this guy to sing a song. So I know that he, he, he's going to refuse to sing it unless I compensate him. So I make a deal with him. I say, if you sing, I will transfer $1,000 to you. In other words, I hereby transfer $1,000 to you conditioned upon your singing this song. If he sings it, he triggers a condition, the money transfers. Did he buy the song? No. Did he buy the singing? I guess in a metaphorical sense, as long as you keep in mind that no title was transferred back. It was an outcome that I wanted. Okay. So, so the argument goes, well, you have to own something to sell it. So I just think I showed why that's correct, incorrect. So the fact that there's labor contracts, does it show that labor is ownable? Okay. Now the opposite would be what Walter Walker's argument did before. He says, well, if you own something, you have to be able to sell it which goes toward voluntary slavery, right? So he, he says, Stefan, if you own your body, then surely you can sell it in, in, in a slavery contract. It should be enforceable. So his argument is that if you own something, you have to sell it. Now, what's the assumption here? The assumption is that ownership implies the right to sell, but it doesn't. Ownership means the exclusive right to control something, right? You have to have something else to, be, to, to make something sellable. And in my view, this is a little bit of a tangent, but my view is, there are two ways of acquiring two types of property. One is your body. We own our bodies not because we homestead the bodies. We don't acquire our body. We can't exist without our bodies. Okay? We're, that's part of our identity, or our essence, our existence. We have a, there's another reason we own our bodies, and that's because we have a close connection to our bodies. We have a unique, direct control over those resources. Okay? So it's not homesteading. Locke alludes to this a little bit with the idea that God gets everyone the proprietor of himself. He doesn't talk about homesteading there. Right? And for, for things that were previously unknown out in the world, we own those because we have first appropriation on some contract after that. Okay? So for, the, for all these things, the, the first idea is that ownership means you have the exclusive right to control it. So nothing in that implies the right to sell. Not immediately, not directly. But then we recognize, well, this thing was unknown before. I'm the one to acquire it. I have the right to abandon this thing. Right? I can run on it, so to speak. I can return it to the state of nature. And because of that power, which is an implication of the nature of these scarce resources, and an implication of how we come to own these things, that gives you the practical ability 
to abandon it in favor of someone else. You know, I can take this apple, instead of throwing it into the woods, I can hand it to you. Instead of loaning it to you, I can say, I right, now release my claims. Now I've given up my ownership. Now you're holding this unknown thing, you instantly be homesteaded. This is why things that have been homesteaded can be sold. Not because you own them, it's because of the way they were acquired. Things that can be acquired can be deacquired. But we don't acquire our bodies, and our bodies were never unknown. From the moment you were a legal person, or a philosophical person, you were identified and tightly bound up with a body. I'm not going to get into the metaphysical or religious idea of whether you have a soul, or whether you are just your body, or whether there's some, I don't care, it makes no difference. If you're just a body, then your body owns your body, fine. You know, don't give me nonsense about, well, that makes no sense, because what I hear is, you don't think I'm a self-owner. That means you think you're my owner, or someone else's, so I'm going to keep an eye on you. Right? <laughs> uh, how much time do I have? Okay. Hey, right. 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 okay. Um, let me mention one thing for two more minutes. There are some libertarians, like Adam Ossoff, Richard Epstein, they're trying to rehabilitate Locke. They're trying to show that Locke did believe that intellectual property was a natural right, which he didn't. It's wrong. Um, Locke did believe in intellectual property, but just for prudential reasons, like the same reason the founders did. Uh, Locke, in fact, did not believe that his homesteading theory implied um, that intellectual property is a type of right, which, which means I think he realized that he was using an overly metaphorical description. So I think he would have taken my side on this. Uh, number two, so what? I don't care what. If Locke believed in intellectual property, he was dead wrong, just like he was wrong about slavery. Um, so I'll stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs>